Hi, I'm Danny Perry with Mass Media. And I'm Trent Standing with Split Decision Entertainment. And you're watching MMA Superstars. Today we're going to talk about the FCFF and the Rumble at the Roseland 68 coming up this upcoming Saturday, December 15th at the Roseland Theater in Portland, Oregon. It's definitely not too late to go out there and get your tickets. Visit the FCFF.com. Get your tickets. It's going to be a great show. Today we're going to be talking about a few of the fights off of the undercard. We're going to go over the main card. And before we're all done, Trent and myself will give you our picks. Let's do it, Danny. Let's kick off this undercard with uh, one of the fights I'm really looking forward to. Uh, let's take a look here. We have Jimmy Jennett and Alex Zapedia from uh, Enoch Wilson's gym down south. Newer guy. He's newer to the scene. He's come up two fights in the last oh, two, three months. His first fight, he came out and did nothing but high roundhouse kicks the head. You wouldn't think a guy with his build could reach that high with his foot, but basically landed about six or seven of them in a row. Didn't even throw a punch, if I recall right and uh, knocked the kid out. Second fight came out, um, just only being 1-0 and against Chase Alderman, the X amount heavyweight champion. Uh, Zipedia's a state champion wrestler, from what I've heard, and he chose to keep it on his feet, not show his hand that he's a uh, standout wrestler, and slugged it out with one of the hardest hitters um, up north that they have with Chase Alderman and uh, knocked him out in about a minute and a half, I believe. Heavy hands, good movement, very powerful. Uh, tell us a little bit about Jimmy, Danny. I know you've seen him quite a bit. Yeah, this ought to be a really good fight. Jimmy Jeanette uh, fights out of Eugene, Springfield area. Uh, he does a lot of work with Art of War. Uh, he also does a lot of charity work. His organization Checkered Pass MMA, they put on some uh, free clinics for the youth of the Eugene Springfield area, trying to keep people on the right path. Uh, Jimmy has a checkered pass, which is why he kind of came up with that name. But uh, if you've ever just seen Jimmy, he's about, I want to say, 6'6". He's a real tall guy. He's built, and he's got a lot of power. He's definitely going to want to keep this fight standing. That works to his advantage. He has a boxing background. But I know that he's worked a lot with Jason Giorgiani of Art of War, uh, working on his ground game, working on his all-around game. Uh, last fight I watched him and Anthony McDonald, one of the best fights I've seen. Jimmy, Jimmy Jeanette uh, uses boxing skills. He took a lot of damage in that, uh, as Anthony McDonald's very skilled himself. Uh, but he just kept coming, kept coming. It was an action-packed fight, so... I hope this one stays standing. I remember that fight. There was actually a lot of damage on the feet from both Anthony McDonald and Jimmy. That was a great, great fight. Uh, this fight for me on paper is a pick em. You know, Jimmy's tough. Jimmy, I think the key to Jimmy winning this fight is keeping it on his feet, using his 6'6 six -six frame to play the distance game, the range game on uh, Zipedia and try and come out with a win that way. I think possibly, I haven't seen too much of uh, Jimmy on the ground, but if from what I hear is true about Zipedia on the ground, uh, it could be a raw deal for him if he ends up on his back. Yeah, that's it's always tough, you know, when uh, if, you, if you don't have a tough ground game, it's a huge disadvantage when you're going with somebody with such a strong wrestling background. Uh, again, ought to be a great fight. It's one of the fights I'm really looking forward to seeing. Uh, man, this is a tough one for me to pick. Uh, I think, you know, I think I'm going to go with Jimmy Jeanette. I know Jimmy. I'm a huge fan of Jimmy's. Um, I'm probably going against common knowledge, but, uh, you know, with Alex Lapita. Um, another thing, Alex is trained out of KO Fitness. By, uh, he's trained by Enoch. Is that right? Yeah, that's, that's yeah, tough because uh, I have the utmost respect for Enoch and for that camp. So it's going to be a tough, tough battle. But uh, still, I'm going to cast my vote for Jimmy. So.
You, you know, you mentioned Enoch with uh, KO Fitness. Right now, they have my vote for Gym of the Year just because they've come from nothing. In just one year, they've had fighters in championship fights. They have an outstanding uh, amateur record right now as far as wins and losses. And these, aren't, these aren't a bunch of guys. Enoch's not a type of guy that picks his fight and takes patsy fights for his guys. He's gotten them in there, taken tough fights against other champions. He's not afraid of throwing his guys in there with the best of the best right now. And uh, like I said, he's got my vote for not only Coach of the Year, but Gym of the Year as an upstart here in their first year down there at KO Fitness. So big props to them. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to agree. I'm, I'm a big fan as well. Well, that leads us up to uh, our next fight off the undercard. Jess Lane versus Brian Satsumi. That's going to be another war. It That is going to be a barn burner. The big key for Jesse, I think, in this fight is to keep it on his feet and get his hands moving. Satsumi, we've seen get hit hard. He gets rocked and he just keeps coming forward. Satsumi, if he gets Lane to the ground, is going to have a lot easier time with him than if he keeps it on his feet. Jesse's game, stick and move. Keep moving, keep moving. Make Susumi, who's in, always in excellent shape, phenomenal movement, five rounds, three rounds, whatever it is, the kid doesn't stop. He's excellent. But Jesse Lane needs to basically play the Greyhound game with him, stick and move, make him run around, and make him pay for close the distance whenever he can. That is going to be a great fight. You know, it's really interesting. I wonder which Brian Susumi is going to show up. The Brian Susumi who fought a really tough uh, competitor, David Converse, and defeated him. Um, or the guy that fought Alex Corrales and was KO'd. Um, if not for that bout against Alex Corrales, I would, uh, Brian Susumi um, would be uh, at the top of every list, I, I think. Um, but it's it's just going to be interesting to see how that goes. You know, Susumi only has a loss against Corrales. And that, you know, Corrales right now is absolute top of the food chain, number one, at 125 pounds. Uh, the fact of the matter is that fight was with Susumi and Corrales. Susumi came right out, was backing Corrales up, and was landing big shots. Corrales planted his feet, came straight forward and knocked him out. It happens. Four-ounce gloves, anything's going to happen. But uh, up until that knockout punch, I had Susumi win in that fight. It wasn't very long. But Susumi came right out, is very aggressive, did everything right. But uh, Corrales, Speedy Alex Corrales, they call him Speedy for a reason. He makes holes out of nothing at all and uh, landed leather right on the jaw, and that's it. Don't discount Brian Susumi. Um, I hope here in the future we see Tsutsumi Corrales fight again. They are a great matchup, and, uh, you know, but first thing first, Tsutsumi's got to get past Jesse Lane. It's not going to be an easy task. You know, I agree. I'd love to see that rematch as well between Alex Corrales and Brian Tsutsumi. Uh, but given how tough Brian Tsutsumi is, what, what do you, how do you call this fight for, um, for Jess Lane? You know, honestly, it depends how it goes. If Susumi comes out and wants to stand like he did um, in a lot of the fight versus Corrales uh, the first time they fought, um, you know, it could go towards Jesse Lane's favor. Jesse Lane has quick hands. As long as he moves around good, he could upset Brian Susumi. But make no mistake, this fight is Brian Susumi's fight to lose. Um Jesse Lane's going to have to come out with a big game plan and a way to stop the takedowns of Susumi and uh, a way to basically nullify Susumi's movement. And that's Jesse Lane's key to victory in this fight. But Susumi is definitely the favorite in my eyes coming in here. And uh, Jesse Lane has his work cut out for him. Hey, um, let's talk a little bit about Impact Jiu-Jitsu where Susumi trains out of. You mentioned, too, that Brian Satsumi, every time this guy fights, he's in fabulous shape. I mean, he, he prepares very well for fights. If not, you know, for, for, for um, the Alex Krause fight, 
you know, which can happen to anybody. Um, he, he's dominated every fight I've seen him in. W what does that say about Impact Jiu-Jitsu? Well, what a lot of people don't even see is the Impact Jiu-Jitsu guys, they wear me out down in the warm-up room before they even <laughs> come up to the cage. I have never seen uh, fighters go through the warm-up process before a fight, like what Impact does with them, and that just goes to speak of their absolute phenomenal top-level shape before they even let their guys step up in the cage. Their warm-ups consist of a b darn near an hour of cardio and drills and working out and situational things down in the warm-up rooms. I don't honestly, when I fight, uh, you know, I have a pretty long history at the Roseland. I don't even like being in the same corner as those guys because they're always on the mat in the warm-up room, you know, drills and everything else beforehand. And it wears me out as a heavyweight just watching those guys for an hour before they step up in the ring. And, you know, the crazy thing is, is they get up there when they enter the ring, it's like they're fresh. They are phenomenal athletes. Impact doesn't put anyone out into that cage until they're ready. Uh, Impact's another one of those places where if you're serious about fighting, it's the kind of place to go. If you're, you know, if you want to get in there and jump in the cage, probably not the right place to go right off the bat because they will make sure you are at the level they want you to be at before they put you up there in the, in the slammer. And Jesse Lane's fighting out of Team Chaos out of Salem. Team Chaos known for putting a lot of guys out in the cage. Um, they have a pretty storied past. Um, how much do you know about Team Chaos and, and, and how they train in comparison? Team Chaos is great. You know, they, for a while there, they, they stuck to the United Combat shows. We didn't see a whole lot of their athletes come down into the FCFF, into Budo fights, into the other fight shows around here. Um, but UCS has kind of slowed down as far as the frequency of their shows. And it's nice to see their guys get out and fight in the FCFF and the other, you know, local shows around. Because it really didn't give a real clear picture just how good they were when they were fighting in the UCS the United Combat shows. They've come to the FCFF and done very well. Um, they've gone down to the Midtown shows and done very well. Jason Gray right now is one of the top guys, in my opinion, uh, in the top five at 155 pounds and I think he could probably drop down to 145 I'm not sure but uh, even at 155 pounds he's ranked right up there in the top five guys um, they had a little 145 pounder I forget his name uh, but he had a phenomenal record uh, I watched him dominate Jess Moore who we'll talk about here in a little while um, in one of the UCS shows and they have a very solid camp. Jesse Lane's out of there. You know, you see a lot of people stop, drop by to uh, train out of there. Um, the number one ranked 200, or formerly number one ranked 205 uh, pounder is out of there. He just got done beating the professor, Bill Bradley, uh, Ray Garcia. Um, they have a very solid core group, and anytime you have a very, very solid core group of experienced guys, steel sharpened steel, and uh, every, it's going to make everyone better. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I agree, man. They, they uh, well, you know, we're blessed, real quick, just to take a minute here and talk about some of the gyms. Um, it's one of the things that I don't know how much people outside the MMA community realize is that the Pacific Northwest has just put together um, a, a long, long storied history of putting out top fighters. A lot of the local gyms, I'm going to run down a quick list. You have Team Quest, Alive MMA, 503 West, Case, West Coast Jiu-Jitsu, Brave Legion out of Vancouver, um, Straight Blast Gym, Girls Gym, Animal House out of KO Fitness, Next Level MMA, Team Chaos, L.A. Boxing, down in the Eugene area, Midtown MMA, um, Northwest Martial Arts, Art of War. I'm probably missing a few here. Out of Albany, Oregon, you've got Victory Boxing. And, of course, Team Chaos is out of Salem. Um, but those are just to name a few, and I'm probably missing a ton of people out there. Um, yeah, let, 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 me, let me add a few, actually. Sure. Uh, Danny, you have Gladiator Combat over in Vancouver. Oh, yeah. And they've put out... Um, <laughs> 
champions like Simone, or Simon, I'm sorry, who just won the 145 pound title, or is about to anyway, uh, look for him. He will take the belt at 145 pounds, mark my words. Um, 185 pound champion, Jake Smith, um, is out of there. FCFF champion, Jake Smith. Um, gosh, lots of athletes, lots of good guys out there that haven't really filtered into the FCFF yet, but look out for them. They have a lot of good guys out of there. Also, you have Battleground Combat Club, which just started uh, not too long ago by Ray Armstrong. Uh, you have uh, John Simone out of there. Um, tough kid, look for him to get hardware. The longer he sticks with it, the better he's going to do. Um, you have a couple other real tough upper weights out there, and they have, just within the last six, eight months, built a very good core group. Um, you also have Arsenal Combat up north in Longview, and their guys come down to the uh, FCFF occasionally now, but I have a feeling uh, with the rule changes in the state of Washington, they're going into effect at the start of this year. We're going to start seeing more of their guys come down and fight in the FCFF and the leagues in Oregon uh, more and more as they get ready to move into the pro ring. So um, those are just three right there off the top of my head. And, you know, you have the old touch em up guys um, that have kind of dispersed through there since touch em up gym is – and Fisticuffs gym. Fisticuffs has – a couple real, really good guys that are coming down. Moa Ben um, is one of them at 170 pounds who holds the Fisticuffs 170-pound belt. Tough kid. He just got done beating a 4-1 Scott Titan out of KO Fitness. We talked about them a minute ago um, with Enoch Wilson's one of Enoch Wilson's guy in a tough fight that went five rounds. So up in Washington now in that little Vancouver pocket is starting to become a really really uh, even playing field as far as talent goes and you know good fighters are spread out all over up there in Vancouver yeah man we've been blessed I can't believe I left off gladiator that was a mistake there anyhow um, you know we, we we got a few girls on the card a couple girl fights on the bottom of uh, or not on the bottom but on the undercard um, just to kind of list list them out real quick um, Julia Jones, and who I have uh, out of Everett, Washington. I don't think I've ever seen her fight. Plus Kyra Batara out of Animal House. Um, haven't seen her either, but you know, you know, if Enix training training her, then that's going to be a fight to watch. And then uh, at the top of the undercard, we have Katie Howard versus Amanda Lowen. And both of these girls are tough, and they're very, very good at Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Yeah. And, you know, you, you mentioned Kyra Batara. She's out of Animal House Kale Fitness. Uh, another lady out there in Animal House Kale Fitness is Emily Whitmire, who's excellent at jiu-jitsu. They call her the blonde bomber. She has very heavy hands um, for her little teeny tiny size. And, you know, she's training partners with Emily. And, you know, she's working with Emily that she is ready to fight before she steps in the cage. That is going to be a good fight with uh Batara and Jones. It's one that I'm looking forward to. Yeah, me too as well. And the other fight between Katie Howard and Amanda Lowen, both of these girls were on um, on the Rumble uh, Rumble at the Roseland 64 back in July. Both girls fought different opponents, but on the same card. They both came out with victories, and here they are. They're going to face each other in a tough match. Katie won her fight via a, a first-round tap of Kayla Sh Shivers. Hopefully I'm saying the last name right. And um, Amanda Lowen won a unanimous decision against Rachel Collar. Um, both of those girls are pretty tough. I got some video. You want to watch some video on these girls? Definitely. Let's see it. All right. I'm going to go with... Uh... Okay, here we've got Katie Howard. There's no sound on this video, but you can see she's a tough, tough. She's got some tough jits going on. She's also uh, not afraid to hit people. <laughs> uh, 
Now that was a tough fight there. That took place on July 21st, 2012 at uh, Rumble at the Roseland 64. And that was a round one tap out uh, by Katie Howard. What'd you think? Katie Howard's tough. She's well trained. Both of her wins come by arm bar in uh, under two minutes, both fights. 2 and 0, undefeated. She's little, only five foot five. She, you know, that's about average, I guess, for the 125 pound uh, class that she's fighting in. But, uh, you know, she's the, you could say she's the armbar queen. I don't know, might, might be an easy call to call it early submission armbar. I don't know. Let me show you some video on Amanda Lowen. Um, Amanda is, I, I couldn't find any fight video up here, but here's some action of her. It's a highlight reel put together by Straight Blast Gym, which is the gym that she trains out of. And she's been in a few JITS tournaments. Showing here, she's uh, tapping some folks. She's got some skills of her own. Um, here she's seen um, competing against a male. Now she's seen here competing with another female. Um, but she's got some skills. Uh, she is no stranger to the uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu game. So I think Katie Howard could have potentially a tough time um, maybe getting that arm bar. Maybe. And she's well trained. She's out of one of the top, you know, JIT schools around here in the Portland area. I don't know. I've gone back and forth and back and forth on this one. She has a little bit of a height advantage. She's about two inches taller. Um, it's going to be a good fight. It's definitely going to be a good fight, but you can pretty much bet your bet your butt on it hitting the ground and it turn into a jits battle because both these girls like to work their ground games. But you never know. Sometimes you say that and both the girls respect each other's games and they'll sit up and bang it out. I'm good for standing or on the ground. Let's see it. Let's do it. Let's see what the outcome is. Well, you know, that wraps up kind of the fights that we were going over for the undercard. Before we get to the main card... Let's tally up the votes and see who we got. I'm uh, I'm gonna pick in the the first fight we covered, Jimmy Jeanette versus Alex Zepeda. I'm gonna go with Jimmy Jeanette. I know I'm going against popular, um, you know, what is perhaps maybe popular opinion. Who who do you like in that fight? You know, honestly, I love Jimmy. I'm a big fan of Jimmy. I just don't think this is a good fight with him. You put Jimmy against a stand-up guy to where he can bang it out for three rounds. I'll give Jimmy the nod on that. I think Zapadia is too too well versed. I think Zapadia will come out. I think he'll put him on his back, and I don't think that's a good look for Jimmy. Um, you know, in these type of situations where, where someone's six foot six inches tall, like what Jimmy is. And where Zapadia is about six one six two, there's a lot of height difference there, and it makes a lot of the times it makes it easier for the shorter guy to get the takedowns. You know, when they shoot the low singles, ankle picks, that type of thing. Zapadia is a state champion wrestler. I don't think he's going to have trouble with the takedown uh, from what I've seen with Jimmy. I'm heading towards Zapadia, but I'll tell you what, if Jimmy can find a way to keep this standing up. Zapadia is going to have a fight on his hands. It's going to be a rock'em, sock'em type thing because Zapadia will take one to give one, and the crowd will absolutely go crazy for that, guaranteed. But I think Zapadia is a little bit smarter than that. I think Enoch Wilson in his corner is going to have him come out and take Jenna down. But we've seen crazier things like him stand up and slug it out last time when he fought a slugger who was the heavyweight champion for X amounts. Uh, X amounts league. So I'm going to give the nod towards Zapedia, but we'll see. Anything, anything definitely can happen. Now, you know, next week we're going to be doing recaps. We're going to be going over these, and, and, and we're going to be held accountable for these picks. So <laughs> no pressure. All right. um, Jesse Lane versus Brian Sutsumi. You know, I, I got to give the nod to Brian Sutsumi. I think that he's tough. I don't think there's many that can beat him. Um, I, and I think that Brian Sutsumi can beat anybody in his weight class on any given day. So, I, 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 all the respect in the world to Jess Lane. I think that um, if Jess Lane can put together a really good game plan, uh, and, and, you know, he definitely has a chance, but I think, uh, I think you mentioned earlier this would be Brian's to lose, in my opinion. 
And I'm picking Jesse Lane on this, and I'll tell you why. Jesse Lane has a lot of experience. He has about two to three times the fights as Susumi does. I think he will come into this fight with a game plan to stay away from Susumi, to punch and run, to pick his shots. And if he does get on the ground, I think he's smart enough to play conservative to where he's not going to leave something out. This is only three rounds. He has nine minutes to land leather on Susumi's jaw, which right now is still a big question mark. We've seen him get hit hard the first time versus Corrales. We've seen him get hit hard versus Converse. I think Jesse, I have faith in Jesse Lane that he'll find the leather that he needs to find on the chin of Susumi. I'm picking Jesse Lane for this one. All right, all right. Uh, so far, we're at opposite ends. All right, let's uh, talk about Katie Howard versus Amanda Lowen. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with Katie Howard on this one. I, I just like her striking to go with her jits. Uh, I, I could be completely wrong. You know, I, I know a little bit about Amanda, and just I, I believe she, this is gonna be a great fight that could go either way. But just for the sake of giving a pick, I'm gonna go with uh, Howard. Whew, this one's a tough one. Um, wow. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm going to disagree with you again this time. I'm going to go with Lowen. I think Lowen's well-versed enough on the ground. She's been through the jiu-jitsu tournaments. She's been through um, the big tournaments to where she's going to be able to see those arm bars coming. Katie Howard, though might surprise us. You have a good pick in Katie Howard. I just think Lowen, especially uh, with a little bit of a height advantage, if it does stay on the feet, even two inches when you're only five foot five inches tall is is proportionally a pretty good pretty good uh, advantage. And Lowen has the Jits game to holy hopefully uh, nullify Howard. I'm going with uh, Amanda in this one. Do you want to pick we should probably pick, since we mentioned it, we didn't really go with the fight too much, Julia Jones versus Kyra Batara. I'll let you pick first on this one, <laughs> since I've got to pick on another one. Um, you know what? I'd give the... Uh, when it comes down to amateurs, the old saying is experience is key. Experience is king. You know, even Julia, Julia Jones, even this will be her fourth time in the cage. Uh, Kyra's first time, you know, I got to go with Jones. Um, you know, when, when everything looks about even on paper, you got to give the nod towards experience. And I'm just one of those experienced guys. Experience is king. Nice. You know, I, it's another tough one. You know, I don't know a, a great deal about these fighters, but I'm going to go with Batara primarily because she's, she's training with Emily Whitmire. She's being trained by Enoch Wilson, and that can't be good for Julia Jones. So I'm going to go with Batar on that one. It looks like we are straight down the middle. we got four, four bouts that we talked about on the undercard, and we'll have four on the main card, which will have us a total of eight picks by the time we're done. And leading into the very bottom of the main card, you mentioned earlier Jason Gray. He's going to be fighting Kevin Walker, uh, and Walker lists his gym as um, Wa um, Walker MMA, I believe. So I don't know if he's self-trained or if he's fighting for a gym. Um, I believe the story on that is his brother owns a martial arts gym out in the, if I remember right, the Tualatin area, uh, Beaver and Tualatin area. Um, Kevin's fought for me twice, very skilled, very good stand-up, uh, good ground game. Where I worry about him a little bit in this fight is the take and defense that Jason Gray has. Jason Gray is one of those guys that will come out, will take you down, and will just flat grind on you until time runs out. It's tough to win off your back. Um, he's very conservative. You don't, you don't even see guys throwing their legs up. Uh, over his shoulders to even be in position to throw a triangle choke or get an arm bar because he stuffs it before the legs even come up. He's very positional, and, uh, you know, even 
even though a lot of guys call him works for him and because of that he has a record he has uh, and uh, he's very tough to beat yeah I, I um, Jason Gray is impressive in his ability to control his opponent um, but Jason if you're out there and if you're listening we would love to see you add to your game um, we would love to see maybe something a little more than just uh, take down and control uh, on the ground although you know Whatever works, I, I, I just I can't argue with what works. Um, would love to see some more striking out of Jason Gray to round out his game. And I, whether or not Kevin Walker will be able to stuff the takedown is the question for me. Um, nobody's been able to do it yet, so I, I don't see any reason to think that uh, Kevin Walker is going to be able to um, keep this fight standing. The state of Oregon had a good thing going a little while ago with allowing the state of Oregon allowing smokers to happen um, that weren't sanctioned by the state. And when I say sanctioned by the state, it's a kind of code word, meaning uh, the state isn't excessively charging them to put on the events. Um, those type of things, if I was Jason Gray's coach, I would absolutely push him into to do things like kickboxing matches and get experience with his stand-up. That's how guys like Jason Gray start to round out their game. Now, who knows? Maybe in practice he's good on his feet. Maybe in practice he's knocking people down. And maybe he just feels that way when he comes into the cage. Everything he can do for a win, he's going to do. If he doesn't have to take a risk and stand up and slug it out with someone, then why should he? At this point in the amateurs, though, he needs to start looking towards... How can I improve my game? Do I want to go pro? If I do go pro, how do I make myself more of a well-rounded fighter to where I'm going to put butts in the seats to pay my wage to justify promoters bringing me in to fight? He is just about at that stage, I believe, um, to where he needs to start experimenting and starts to break out of his shell and doing something else. And uh, he's up for a belt here. I say, hey, if I was his coach, I'd say do what you do. Jason, next fight, let's start working on a little bit of stand-up. But with Kevin Walker, I don't think Kevin Walker's the right guy for him to start trying to work stand-up because Kevin Walker is <laughs> very effective on his feet. Kevin Walker can kick, he can punch, he can knee. And if Jason Gray makes a mistake, Kevin Walker's going to walk home with that belt. Yeah, you know, I think that's great advice. I And I hope I'm not trying to sound too critical of Jason Gray. I actually have – I'm a huge fan of Jason Gray's. I think he's a terrific fighter. Um, I just want to see him evolve into a more well-rounded fighter, like, like you mentioned. But if I'm his coach, I, 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 I would mimic exactly what you just said. I, I wouldn't pick this fight to start working on your stand-up. So it's yeah. a, a, definitely a tough fight. And do we want to go for picks on this one? I, I'm picking Jason Gray on this one. And the reason why is because I haven't seen anyone yet. Uh, stop great Jason Gray's takedown. The only one that came close to it was Joaquin Rodriguez, who in my opinion is top three um, at 145 or 155 pounds. I'll even go out on a limb and say, no, nah, I'd say top five at 155 pounds, but top uh, three at 145 pounds. And even Joaquin uh, Rodriguez had a hard time stopping Jason Gray's takedowns. Right now, I don't think there's anyone... Uh, that can stop Jason Gray's takedowns, except for the top three, you know, Clint Patterson, um, Jason ba or, uh, Baker, Sean Baker out of a live MMA, the top level elite wrestlers are the only guys right now that I can think are going to give uh, Jason Gray a problem. Sean Baker and, and uh, Jason Gray, there'd be a matchup I'd like to see. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to agree with you on this one. This would be the first fight that I think we agree on. Jason Gray, um, nobody's been able to take stop his takedowns, and Kevin Walker, I think, is going to have his his work cut out for him. But I, I, I say it with with a, with a qualifier: if Kevin Walker can keep this fight standing, he he wins. Um, I, I just, I'm with you. I don't think any it's going to be tough to do, even knowing um, what what Jason Gray is going to come up with, and, and he's going to come out and fight. He's going to be looking to take this down. He's, you know, one thing I noticed with Jason is he opens his takedowns with strikes. He doesn't sit there and bang, but he throws a good strike and shoots 
and it's so quick it's really tough to defend. And and that's and that's the little preamble to him getting confidence in his striking game. He'll come out, you'll see him grow a little bit more. You'll see him start to throw that one two punch instead of diving in right for a big takedown, he'll step in and throw a big punch and then do it. It's the little teeny tiny key that he's starting to build before he gets confidence in that stand-up game and before we see him uh, be as well-rounded as what he can because Jason Gray has phenomenal athletic ability. Yeah, he's definitely quick. I'm, uh, I loved your advice earlier. Really. I'd love to see him in a smoker. I think that would be great for him down the road. That leads us up to our next fight, Jess Moore versus Dylan Atkinson. Another tough one. Um, you know, I saw Jess Moore. Um, first off, let's hope that Jess Moore does not get hurt for this. This fight's been scheduled two or three different times, and Jess Moore has had injuries. Um, so let's hope that this fight goes off. Um, Dylan Atkinson has been pretty much the golden boy uh, of his weight class. His last fight, I think, maybe, possibly, he got a little bit exposed to where he's not quite as good as what everyone thought it was. He fought Journey Newsom, and Newsom took him to a unanimous decision. Yeah, it was a pretty dominant unanimous decision, but I think it opened up a lot of people's eyes um, as far as just a little bit of a key to what it's going to take to beat Dylan Atkinson, because until this point, no one's had a clue. No one's been able to solve that puzzle once that door shuts with Dylan because he's been so dominant. He's gotten away with everything he's tried, and he's basically done everything he's wanted to do uh, in the cage. Just more needs to come out. He needs to lay he needs to defend the takedown. He needs to sprawl and brawl, and he needs to take his time and look for the opportunities against Dylan Atkinson to get his takedowns and to get his quick subs and to beat him up. Take your time. You have five rounds. Uh, still even even saying that, again, this fight's Dylan Atkinson's to lose. He's number one uh, ranked in his weight class, and uh, it's just going to be a tough night, I think, for Just Moore. Yeah, let's take a look at Jess Moore. Here's Jess Moore back in January 21st when he was fighting Sean Solis at Rumble at the Roseland 61. And Jess Moore defeated Sean Solis via a round one triangle choke. And there's a wicked slam. Jess Moore keeps battling through it. He fights. And Sean Solis taps. It was a great fight. Both fighters uh, have the utmost respect for Sean Solis. This was, that was a good fight. I remember watching it. And Jess Moore did a great job. Um, I think Sean Solis might have been the favorite in that fight. And Jess Moore, uh, he's proven that he can beat the odds and, and get a win. What do you think? Well, looking at uh, Jess Moore, again, we I, I've... I go down his record and say, who, is he's, who has he had really problems with? Um, one of the people he's had problems with that I mentioned earlier, Andy Pickett, out of Team Chaos, was is basically a carbon copy of Dylan Atkinson. Um, Andy Pickett beat him up bad for five rounds at United Combat Show. I think Dylan Atkinson, honestly, is going to do the same exact thing. Jess Moore has have better come a long way in his wrestling and his takedown defense ability to even hang with Dylan Atkinson. Um, after saying that, we just saw a submission off his back where he caught Sean Solis. Um, so it can happen, but uh, it's it's going to be a tough road for Jess Moore. Like I said, let's hope he stays healthy enough. I really want to see this fight. Let's take a look at Dylan Atkinson now. Um, as you know, Dylan Atkinson doesn't have many holes in his game. You know, he's just, he's a position guy. He gets great position. Once he gets it, he doesn't lose position very easily. 
Uh, he's strong for his weight class. He overpowers guys. He's pretty versatile. Um, I actually think that Dylan Atkinson is probably most impressive on the ground, but his stand-up is also excellent, I think. And he just doesn't have a lot of weaknesses. Here we see him um, where he tapped another great fighter in, in um, Justin Mark. Justin Mark, who held, he held the title for, for years. Dylan Atkinson was able to successfully take it, that away from him. Uh, that was back again at Rumble 61, January 21st. Uh, Rumble at the Roseland 61 was a heck of a card. <laughs> a lot of good fights on that card. Yeah, and, and again, in situations where you have two really good guys like this with impressive records, you look down through the record and see who they've actually fought. Dylan Atkinson has fought everyone tough that there is. He's fought Journey Newsom, Nicholas Snow you can throw on that list. of tough guys, Justin Mark he's beaten. Um, Christopher San Jose, who was an excellent stand-up guy, um, he's beaten Jake Burns from up at from Arsenal Combat, who came into that fight, I believe, with a record of something around nine and one. Um, he beat Stephen Wing out of Redneck Militia, a very tough kid that's a champion in a different league now. He beat, you know, he has beaten a who's who in the 135-pound division. And uh, like I said, he, he's on he's on top of the pile right now, and it's his fight to lose. But he has experience. He has a very impressive record. He's trained out of a live MMA. His jujitsu is always on key. Uh, his stand up there with Coach Nick Gillardi um, is always on key. He does exactly what he has to do to get in, win, get the victory, and leave. But again, Journey Newsom went five rounds with him. It's a little piece of that puzzle that went into place on solving the riddle of Dylan Atkinson once that door shuts. Yeah, it's going to be, um, I, I would have to agree. It sounds like um, you and I agree that Jess Moore is going to have his work cut out for him. Um, you going to go with Dylan Atkinson in this bout? Definitely. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to second that. And Jess, to you, good luck. And prove us wrong, buddy. Go out there and, and, and give it a heck of a fight. Uh, it's anybody's night on any given night. So good luck to both fighters. You know, that brings us to the, the, the second to the last bout prior to the main event would be Nick Byron versus Jason Pittman. Again, another alive MMA fighter. Alive does nothing but put fighters out out there to compete, and they do nothing but win. Um, I, I'd also like to point out that 503 West Coast Jiu-Jitsu, another gym that does nothing but put guys out there, and they do, you know, they win. They put out a lot of fighters. Um, do you think that Alive MMA versus 503, is there a rivalry there? Absolutely. Absolutely. For those of you um, that don't know kind of the history, and I'm not going to get too far into it, um, some of Alive MMA way back in the day split off and went to 503 West Coast Jiu-Jitsu and formed 503 West Coast Jiu-Jitsu. Um, there was a lot of um, what some people said was foul play as far as recruiting members, as far as uh, getting people to come over. Um, I'll just leave it at that, but let's just say there's a lot of hard feelings between the two. Uh, there used to be a lot of hard feelings between the two, um, all the way to the point where uh, a year ago in one of my shows, they darn near faced off in the cage, what almost turned out to be a team-on-team -team type thing. They are extreme rivals, and rivalry is good. And rivalry isn't one of those things where we should say, hey, everyone should get along. It's great that they're rivals, because when these fights happen between a head coach of 503 West Coast Jiu-Jitsu and the top number one fighter uh, in the state of Oregon and the Northwest rankings, not only at heavyweight but 205, that makes for a big fight. That's a hype-type fight. I am excited to see it. I think Nick Byron has looked, his defense has looked penetrable, his offense is excellent, um, but if anyone's going to beat Nick Byron, it's going to be Jason Pittman, and I'll tell you why. 
Jason Pittman has just as long as a reach, if not longer than a reach, of Nick Byron. Jason Pittman, his base is boxing. When we started out at Kurt's Ultimate uh, back in 2005, I believe, um, he was nothing but a boxer at that point, training with uh, Coach Curtis Crawford. We brought him over to MMA and started getting him work in MMA. He has the boxing game, I think, that's equivalent to Nick Byron that we see most most of the time Nick Byron goes in, he's on his feet. He's You don't see him very much on his back. I think if it does go to the ground, maybe I would give a slight edge to Jason Pittman. I think Jason Pittman um, has the ground game to contend or beat Byron on the ground. Um, even after saying that, it's anyone's game. Nick Byron is ranked number one at 205 pounds and and heavyweight for a reason. He's very accurate with his strikes. I would like to see that kid's um, actual land percentage from what he throws. It's got to be through the roof, absolutely phenomenal high, because he throws in combinations and he hits hard. Um, it's going to be a tough fight for Jason Pittman, but if anyone's going to upset Nick Byron, it's going to be Jason Pittman. You know, this is, for me, it's a tough matchup. I have the utmost respect for both of these gyms. Two, two, two of my favorite um, gyms to watch, the fighters from. Um, I got to tip my hat to Nick Gilardi of, uh, of uh, Alive MMA and the great job that he does coaching his fighters. These guys come out as a team. They walk out together. They train hard together. And they, they are the the essence of a great team, and that's a that's a credit to Nick Gilardi as a coach. Um, on the flip side of that, you have 503 West Coast Jiu-Jitsu, where these guys are like a family. They are also close-knit. These guys run together. They hang out together. They do things together. They are very, very close-knit, and they, they both, in a lot of ways, uh, they're very different, but in a lot of ways, they're very similar. Um, so as far as the camps go, like both of these guys, you know, it's going to be, this is a tough pick for me. I really like Nick. I really like Jason. Uh, I think, like you said, uh, anybody can win. But Nick's number one. And, you know, for that reason, I'm probably going to have to go with Nick on this one. Jumping on the bandwagon. Last year, last year, Nick Gilardi was voted number one coach of the year, a live MMA uh, I, I can't remember if their gym was voted number one gym of the year, but I definitely remember Nick Gilardi was voted coach of the year. Um, you know, he knows what it takes to win these fights. But after saying that, at the end of the day, it's the fighter that's in the cage, and it's Byron against Pittman. I'm going to give a little bit of an edge towards Pittman. I'm going to go with Pittman on this one uh, for a couple reasons. I'll tell you why. Number one, Pittman has a crew over there, a heavyweight crew uh, of Damian Martindale, Rico Martinez, um, Jeremy Morse, all guys that are in the top heavyweights right now, or 205 pounders. Uh, Byron doesn't have as many big guys, and the big guys that he has aren't as high as quality as what those former FCFF champion Damian Martindale Split decision champion, fisticuffs champion, Rico Martinez, FCFF champion, Jeremy Morris. He doesn't quite have the quality that Jason Pittman has. And I think Jason Pittman will step into the cage a little bit more well-prepared. I'm going to give a nod towards Jason Pittman on this one. Uh, but like I said, it is a hair between um, going Nick Byron or Jason Pittman. I just think Jason Pittman is due. He's had tough fights, and uh, I think he's going to pull this one out. All right. Let's watch some footage on these guys. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance for this footage on Jason Pittman. I could not find a lot of footage on Jason. I've seen him fight at the Rumble with the Roseland. Here we've got a fight. This is this is from um, back in um, this is back in August of. 2009 at Alive MA's first Friday fights. Um, he's in a bout against someone who I do not recognize and I didn't have information on him. But it does show Jason with a nice takedown um, and, and, and he gets the victory. Looks like, uh, looks like he got a, a, a tap as best as I can make out of it. 
Um, again, I apologize for the footage. It's not that great. Uh, need to get some more footage on YouTube up of Jason Pittman. Uh, he's a terrific fighter. Um, I've seen him fight uh, at Cage of the Coast. I don't remember his opponent, but he knocked that guy out with, uh, um, with knockout power. And to me, it just looked like a glancing blow, um, but he, he, the guy was out. And so Jason Pittman, definitely a tough fighter. That, that clip there that we just saw, Danny, was against Kyle Beck. And Kyle Beck was a former um, outstanding kickboxer, um, has a kickboxing background, and uh, I believe that was second round that we saw there uh, where he closed out Kyle Beck. The first round, uh, Jason Pittman came out, socked him up, took him down, and uh, was in Kyle Beck's guard, beat him up that whole first round. Came out second round, you saw uh, from the clip, landed leather on him pretty significantly to where it dropped Kyle Beck, and uh, and that was it. So Kyle Beck, no slouch back in the day. Um, he had knockout after knockout after knockout. Tough kid. And uh, Jason Pittman has a good, um, very analytical to where he'll come in and he knows exactly what it takes to beat someone and what techniques to use to beat someone, and he'll do it. So if anyone's going to upset Nick Byron, it's going to be Jason Pittman. I, I can't wait to see that fight. Uh, it's going to be great. Let's take a look here. Nick Byron, back when he was fighting uh, at Rumble at the Roseland 61. Again, that was such a great card. Taking on Darren O'Donnell. And here you see uh, Nick trying to take Darren's back. And, and, and wait till you see the size difference here. Nick is, is tall himself, and he just, uh, uh, you see how big Darren O'Donnell is. And what's interesting to me is on this fight was watching Nick, who did not have a reach advantage, work against such a tall fighter and make great advantage of, uh, of getting on the inside, stretching his range, and, and making contact uh, with, against Darren O'Donnell. He does, and he does good. And let's not pretend like, um, you know, he's not a short guy either. He's 6'2", he's 6'3", he's up there. He's a tall kid too, um, and he has those long arms too. Another thing we haven't talked about is he also has boxing experience. He has amateur boxing and bouts, and uh, I believe he lost his first amateur boxing bout um, just recently, but he has a very impressive amateur boxing record. Um, to back him up too. So he has extraordinarily good hands. He has a very firm understanding on how to close that distance on a taller guy that has longer reach. As you saw there with O'Donnell in the clip, he does that. He jumps in to that range very well to where he can throw combinations, and he throws combinations. He's not one of those guys that'll jump in and throw one punch and jump back out. He jumps in with intent to hurt you. He throws three, four punches and will jump back out and be very smart about it. Um, Jason Pittman's got a tough, a, a lot on his plate right now. Um, I just think Jason Pittman is going to solve another one of those riddles, another puzzle piece in there, and uh, hopefully maybe we'll see a new number one ranked 205 pounder. It's going to be a tough fight. May the best man win. Uh, I, again, looking forward to seeing that one. So what do you think about our main card? It's going to be, uh, we have Brave Legion versus uh, Clint Patterson. And Clint Patterson is, he's fighting out of um, Team USA. What do you think? This, this fight's a dream matchup. You have the number one ranked 155 pounder against the number one ranked 170 pounder. Um, Luis uh, isn't huge for 170. Uh, he probably could cut down to 155 or close. Clint Patterson is a big 155. I don't think we're going to see a whole lot of size difference out of these two guys. Uh, Clint Patterson is kind of an independent guy. He fights under Team USA, which bounces around everywhere. That's great because everywhere he goes, he gets different looks from different guys. He's not training with the same guys every day, day in and day out, knows what the, every guy's trick is, 
in the room that he's going up against. He gets around. Um, he's a phenomenal wrestler. He, as we saw in some of his fights, he opens it up and has great striking. I saw him kickbox uh, not too long ago, and he absolutely, I don't know where he got the kickboxing bug from, but he had thunderous kicks and the hands to back it up behind it. He's really got a grasp now on how to hit and hit hard. He moves his body well. Um, that's lethal. When you can when you can punch and kick like that, plus you have the ground game that Clint Patterson has, it's a lot to handle with. It's too much for most amateurs to handle with. I would say Clint Patterson right now is at a good pro level. Um, he's I can't even say he's at an amateur level anymore. It's silly. Um, after saying that, Luis comes out of Brave Legion. Um, he was number one ranked at 170 pounds. Uh, he has training partners like Rick Story, uh, training port partners like Tommy Takamoto, um, and a lot other of the big core group there at Brave Legion, and coached by Pat White, who's put numerous people in the UFC. He is he's number one for a reason. We just saw him fight almost almost an identical guy to Clint Patterson in terms of the wrestling. Um, he fought Jake Morris, and he landed a lot of leather on Jake Morris, and he made Jake Morris plain flat not want to fight anymore. Um, he's tough. This I, I don't know who I'm going to call in this fight um, because I don't discount Clint Patterson, even though he's the lighter fighter. He's a little bit smaller. Luis has about four inches coming into this fight on Clint Patterson, and I would say Luis is probably the better striker. I'd definitely say Clint Patterson's the better ground guy. But Luis and Niguez, out of Brave Legion, they have always, 100% of the time, come into fights with phenomenal game plans that have always won them the fights. Out of every fight I've ever seen a Brave Legion guy come in, and keep in mind, they have fought the best of the best here in the Northwest. I believe I've only seen that team lose one amateur fight ever. Wow, wow. Speaking of which, let's watch some footage of Clint Patterson taking on Jake Morris. This fight um, took place on March 5th, back in 2011, and Clint Patterson loses his fight, although it goes the distance, he loses via a unanimous decision. But, you know, Jake Morris, also a tough wrestler, you mentioned yourself, and also has, maybe it looks to me in this fight like he has a bit of a size advantage. Although, Clint Patterson, you know, he shows you what he can do. Um, on the clip we saw, he, 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 you see his hands, you see his feet at work. So I wonder how far he's come from since then. You mentioned that Lewis has beat Jake Morris, Jake Morris has beat Clint Patterson, you think Clint Patterson has a chance? Well, Jake, pa er, I'm sorry, Clint also beat Jake Morris the first time they met back in 2010. He beat up Jake Morris and he made Jake Morris quit in the second round. <coughs> they came back and they rematched um, in 2011. If I remember right, Jake Morris came in about seven pounds heavy. Um, oh, okay. He looks heavier. I'm not 100 percent. I'm not 100 percent sure on that, but. Uh, little things like that sometimes I remember, and I believe, if I remember right, he came into that fight really heavy, and Clint Patterson said, I'm here to fight, I'm going to fight him anyway, even though he was like seven pounds over, if I remember right, maybe that's not entirely true, and if it's not true, someone correct me, um, but Clint Patterson has just been on a tear, um, beating up William Hill, who's the former FCFF champion, um, fighting Jacob Morris twice, and even even in that unanimous decision uh, where he lost Jacob Morris, I think Clint Patterson should have won that fight. Clint Patterson did a lot more damage. Jacob Morris had position. I score fights when I watch them on damage. It's a fight. It's not a wrestling match. The judges didn't agree with me. They gave the unanimous decision to Jacob Morris, and uh, that's that. But Clint Patterson has fought all the tough guys. He's fought William Hill two times and beat William Hill both times. He's fought Ben Egley. 
and lost to Ben Egley, but he was doing very good up until that point. Um, he's a lot to handle right now. If anyone's going to beat Clint Patterson, it's going to be Luis, and it's I, this is the fight. This is this is Christmas. This is an early Christmas present for me. <laughs> these two fighting. I hope the fight goes through, and uh, it's going to be very good. It, I, I would say this fight's 50-50. Clint has just as much chance to upset uh, Luis as what Luis does to upset Clint. Um, speaking of Luis, who I believe is a monster, let's take a look at this. His matchup back when he fought Benny Dixon at Rumble at the Roseland oh, yeah. 59, September 24th. As you know, Kevin Keeney, always great with his matchmaking, always puts together good fights. And Rumble at the Roseland 59, no exception. And Benny Dixon, by the way, out of live MMA, another tough, tough fighter. Um, quick hands, great stand-up, well-rounded. And right there, he takes one on the chin. Lewis is, you know, he's, again, he, he's well-rounded. He beat a tough opponent in, in um, Benny Dixon. Yeah, I, I remember that fight very well. Let me kind of set that fight. Uh, up a little bit. The clip you just saw was in the second round. The first round, uh, Benny, who was at the time, I believe, uh, three and one, something like that, he had been on a, a, a three fight win streak and looked unbeatable at that point. You saw how big he looked in that clip compared to Luis. Uh, Luis, it was his first fight. And, you know, you take a look at some of these fights, you see a guy that's four and one. Uh, that Benny Dixon was, I believe, at the time, versus the guy that's 0-0, and, and you go, ooh, this is going to be a, you know, might be a beatdown. Luis came out and held his own the first round. Benny Dixon was landing on him. Benny Dixon was also looked a lot bigger than him. Uh, second round came out, and here's where the experience factor of guys like Pat White and Rick Story in your corner really take hold. They made a game plan adjustments for Luis Luis came out second round and took Benny Dixon from advancing on him every step to putting Benny Dixon on his heels to looking for the right combination, which was a right to the body, and then coming up top with that left hook that you saw that knocked Benny Dixon's front tooth into the third row of the crowd <laughs> there at the Roseland. I remember hearing that. Yeah, I remember... Uh... I remember thinking to myself that Benny had the first round, but it was still a close fight. That was just my personal take and going off my memory. But then the second round came, and, you know, that that punch that Lewis threw just, um, it hit clean. It's another one that, that it, it just hit him on a button, hit him in the right place, hit him at the right time. It said, sent his tooth blind in the third row. Um, that, that was... One of the um, that could have been up for a knockout of the year, possibly. I don't know. This is a great, great fight. Very possibly, because the buildup um, into that fight was a live MMA at that time was king. This fight happened in 2011, and that's when a live MMA was just on an absolute tear. Nick Gilardi was coach of the year. Uh, a live MMA went from one person on their MMA team to building an absolute you could say legion, of <laughs> fighters that were winning belts everywhere. Uh, here comes Luis Iniguez out of Brave Legion. No one knows who he is. No one knows what he's about. And he came out and shocked everyone there at the Roseland that night. It was very impressive, but very well put together. Great strategy, great game plan. And uh, like I said, that's... That's just one of those things where you might say because of something like that in a five-round fight against Clint Patterson, he's going to be able to make the game plan adjustments to dial in and hurt Clint Patterson and finish Clint Patterson before the fight ends in that fifth round. Is, is that who you're going with then on that one? Ooh. <laughs> You know, this one's too good. I don't even want to call anyone in this fight. Like I said, this, this, these fights like this 
Kevin Keeney does an excellent job. The FCFF always brings in top-tier talent. He does an excellent job at matching these two. Um, they're exact opposite styles. Most of the time, I'll go with a wrestler over what I consider a stand-up guy in Luis, but I know Luis is just as good off his back as what he is on his feet, and that's dangerous. I'm going to take Luis in this one, but I'll say this. I'm hoping Clint Patterson proves me wrong. <laughs> good one. Yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna have to go with Luis on this one as well. I've seen him fight. Every time I've seen him fight, he looks impressive. And, you know, I, I think I remember him dismantling, um, God, was it Dustin Duffy up at, um, it was your event up there in Vancouver. And, and Dustin Duffy, never, uh, a really tough guy, skilled opponent, who I had, you know, who I had Dustin winning going in. And Luis just... Um, just very skillful, um, and I and I hope I have that right. That that was the matchup, but uh... it, it was the matchup, and he's gotten the scary thing is Luis has g gone leaps and bounds better every time I've seen him fight, and uh, you know he he's an incredible athlete. Some people say, uh, you know, him and Tommy are on the same level, which again is scary because we've seen Tommy fight the absolute best, and we saw Tommy who came out with a game plan against Sean Baker that was very effective where he won that. So you know Brave Legion will come out with a game plan that's going to solve that riddle of Clint Patterson. It's just, it's going to come down honestly. I think Clint Patterson's going to win the first and second round. Whoever wins that third round is going to be key, is, is, is going to win the five-round fight. I don't see either one of these two finishing each other. Um, I think they could finish each other because both of them have knockout power in either hand and their feet and their knees. But uh, I think this is going to go five rounds, and I hope it does because uh, I want a bigger Christmas present than just a short little whoopie <laughs> doing out. So we'll see. You know, uh, one thing that I'll say about this fight is I have a feeling that it's going to be standing. I, I see this one as a stand-up battle. Um, I, I don't know why, but I just think that while it could go to the ground, um, I think that Clint's got good hands and that um, Luis will bang with him. And for that reason, I think that they may wind up putting on a show for the crowd. I think that um, to those who, who are watching this, uh, you're definitely not going to want to miss this. I would go out there, get your tickets early, and come and see what happens. Uh, put, uh, Kevin Keeney's done it again. He's put together another terrific card. We, we time and time again, um, seen him do that. This card is phenomenal from top to bottom. You know, we, we skipped over a lot of the undercard fights on this uh, because of time restraints. But this card has a lot of very well-matched um, fights. It's going to be a spectacular night. But, like I said, the, the cherry on top of this Sunday is this fight between Clint Patterson and Luis Iniguez. And, uh, you know, and on top of everything else, in case you don't know, a live MMA and Brave Legion don't like each other either. And uh, so there's a lot more um, than just these two in the cage. Clint Patterson comes from a live MMA. Maybe that's a little bit of a fuel of the fire for Luis. Maybe it's not. Who knows? But um, hopefully we will see a good fight between these two, Team USA versus Brave Legion. And, uh, you know, anytime, anytime any of the Brave Legion guys take the fight, take the cage, I'll tell you what, it's going to be a good fight, um, but this one's going to be spectacular. You know, I think that wraps it up. You know, um, I'd like to invite our viewers, anybody out there watching, to um, look for the show next week. We'll be doing a recap. Um, when next week comes around, uh, we will have, hopefully, the ability to do some interaction. Perhaps we'll have a phone line set up, or we can do social media, or something along those lines. We'd like to uh, invite viewer participation. Um, we'd like to hear what your picks are in some of these fights. You know, it's, it's not easy to go out there and, and, and pick some of these, and it'd be real interesting to get some other opinions out there. So next week we'll be putting on another show. It'll be a recap show. And that's all I got. Trent, and if you'd like we'll to... See, we'll, see, we'll, see, we'll see just how those picks of yours panned out, Danny. Oh yeah, we gotta bet something. We gotta bet a beer or something. Whoever gets the uh, 
whoever gets the best uh, record out of our picks buys the other one uh, a beer of their choice or a drink of their choice. It has to be alcoholic, though. No non-alcoholic beverages. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll <laughs> buy you a beer, but if I win, you're doing push-ups. <laughs> You, you must have seen me do push-ups before. They look like uh, fifth-grade girl push-ups. <laughs> have you been talking to uh, Brenda at Victory Boxing? Has she been telling you about my push-ups? No, I've got no inside, no inside information <laughs> at all. But I, I'm not. I'm on a no beer diet right now. Uh, for things we'll talk about at a later time, but uh, okay. no beer. But I'll, I'll do push-ups. All right, I should say that. I'll do push-ups if I lose. If you lose. You're buying me a beer. How many push-ups? Oh, wait, does that make sense? Let's. We can do. We can oh, do push-ups. Like 25. We can do push-ups, but uh, my push-ups aren't very pretty. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> All right, we'll figure it out. We'll, we'll we'll figure out the details. All right, we'll see everybody next week. Thank you for joining us on MMA Superstars. We'll be back next week with our recap of uh, Rumble at the Roseland 68. Get your tickets next Saturday at the Roseland Theater in Portland, Oregon. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody. All right, thank you.